Well, I mean, I think Polis, since the depths of the pandemic lockdown, March 2020, has more than doubled in terms of asset center management. And I think different things have driven flows in the last year to prior years and what are going to drive flows going forward. So I think we had a very, very, uh, I think, peculiar set of circumstances post uh, the pandemic and, of course, the markets uh, rallying the way they did. So what drove our flows last year was healthcare, technology, emerging markets. Uh, and indeed, prior to that, other funds were driving flows. The diversification of Polo and the number of teams we've got, the number of strategies we've got, really bodes well for making sure we get flows at different stages in the cycle. Uh, so the COVID winners, in terms of companies, they were all in our portfolios. And of course, everybody wanted access to those COVID winners, the Amazons, the online shopping, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and that really, really drove flows to the point that uh, in mid-2020, we had to soft close our technology fund. We're just concerned about its size. One of the key features of Polo is capacity management. Uh, and what we don't like doing is growing our funds too large so that performance rolls over. So it's very, very much a performance-led culture. But unashamedly active managers, Polar Capital, uh, it's all about performance. Um, we believe that excess volume destroys performance over time, so capacity management is crucial. So, so, so we do need to manage the capacity of our individual funds. Which means, for shareholders, I can't continue adding assets to existing funds because they just get too large and eventually start underperforming. Uh, it's a fact of life. It's a law of diminishing returns. So we look for new teams all the time. We continue to look. I spend more than half my time looking worldwide for good teams who I can add to the stable. Or what we do is we look for funds we can launch with existing teams, what we call team extensions, where they can run new funds that increase their capacity but not overlapping. So capacity is, is one thing in terms of managing the absolute size of capacity, but you can actually increase capacity over time. Right, so Polar, uh, an active performance-led boutique, is very, very, very focused on culture, um, creating the right culture to, be, to promote performance, and also retaining that culture, absolutely key. So from a Polar perspective, there are three main criteria which attracts a good manager to Polo. One is investment autonomy, so the managers can continue managing their portfolio the way they always have done. Second is compensation transparency, so complete transparency over compensation structure, a very direct link between manager compensation and fund performance, so a close alignment of interest. And the third thing, of course, um, is um, uh, capacity management that preserves performance. So all a manager has in his or her career is track record and performance. If we can do for that manager or that team something that preserves their performance over time, they will be attracted to us. So those three criteria is what attracts good teams to Polar Capital, and it's what retains about Polar Capital, because with a, with a transparent compensation structure, they can model out their earnings based on the various assumptions they make. If they outperform, They'll gather assets. If they gather assets, they know what their margins are, and they get paid a direct link between what we generate as revenue and what they get paid. So as an active manager, it's, it's, it's vitally important for us to have differentiated product. It, uh, performance is, you've got to have performance. You've got to outperform the benchmark. You've got to outperform your peer group. So the way we look at performance, we look at it in two ways. We look at uh, peer group performance, so quartile ranking, very, very important, but also we look at our performance against the passives, against the benchmark. Uh, and we might be outperforming our peer group, but if we're not outperforming the benchmark, our clients will go passive. Uh, and that's a big competitor for us. So uh, it's absolutely key to have differentiated product where we actually can outperform. Right, so technology was the original founding basis of Polar Capital 20 years ago. So, you know, two technology managers left Henderson, set up Polar, and that was the start of the story. Uh, and indeed, Technology as a sector um, has grown from then, so has Polar grown, so it's fueled that. Technology um, at the end of uh, last year made up about half of our total asset center management. It's less than that now because all, all of the other strategies are growing. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, technology has been soft closed because we're worried about its size and wanted to control capacity. Um, so other funds are receiving inflows. Uh, tech is now relatively static. Um, and that's how we're evening out our exposure to tech and non-tech. Having said that though, I mean, technology is the largest sector uh, of equities. Um, if you take the tech sector itself plus other 
sectors that are very closely related to tech, like media, uh, Amazon sitting in retail, consumer, so if you, if you take all those. Technology probably makes up 65% of the global index. So I'm not that concerned with Polar having almost 50% exposure to technology. It's no different to what the global equity exposure is. So uh, it's not a worry, although from a business risk point of view, I would quite like to be more diversified across all 15 teams. So in terms of, of, of driving revenue, driving shareholder returns, it's all about using available capacity in all the other teams. So, you know, if tech, if tech runs 10 billion, for argument's sake, there's no reason why five or six of other teams can't run 10 billion each, which means total polar AUM can double or treble on the existing team size. So I don't have to go and lift out and acquire teams to double the size of polar in the short term. All we've got to do is focus on filling existing capacity. So ESG is becoming absolutely essential for every asset manager. So, you know, shareholder engagement, uh, the environment, societal impact, and of course governance has always been important from a fund manager's point of view. And we always have focused on those. So that's always been a key driver for us, particularly the G part, the governance part. What's becoming more in focus now is the environment uh, and the societal um, impacts we have. So in the last two or three years, we really have ramped up our attention on that. Uh, one of our more recent fund and team acquisitions was an emerging market team uh, where ESG was right at the heart of their process. Absolutely key to what they do. And that team is now enjoying significant interest and inflows from their clients who are looking for exposure to emerging markets, but sustainable emerging markets. In other words, they don't want to end up investing in, 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 in carbon companies in emerging markets because they happen to be in emerging markets. They want a clean emerging market fund. And this team is exactly what they do. Uh, given that demand, and we think that demand will continue for sustainable investing, there's no doubt. Um, our most recent team joined us this month. Uh, they have a very, very credible long-term track record in sustainable thematic investing. So very, very narrow, focused areas of thematic investing. Uh, and for them, we will be launching two funds uh, shortly. One is a mobility fund, so smart mobility, and the other one is a um, energy fund, smart energy fund. But very, very much Article 9 funds. Um, our Emerging Market Stars Fund is an Article 8, but the new team, their investment objective will be sustainable objectives. So very, very green in terms of that scale between your Article 6 and your Article 9. So very exciting for Polar. So the industry has consolidated. Uh, that's both an opportunity for Polar um, and I suppose you could call it a threat as well. Um, however, uh, very, very difficult to acquire on an aggressive basis a fund manager where the people are so important because you know, they all go home at night, they come back the next morning. Um, the acquisition of Dalton last year was an example of a, a, a business where it needed scale. Uh, it didn't have scale on its own. With Polar, it was a fantastic fit. It's worked very, very well. So an opportunity and a threat. I think other concerns uh, that I would have for Polar are just uh, maintaining that important culture, that performance-led culture. So it's, it's all about performance. And a slip in performance uh, will see outflows. There's, no, there's no, no doubt about that. Our clients invest in us because they want performance. Um, I think there's always fee pressure in the industry, which is why we have to remain differentiated. So it's got to be highly specialist, differentiated funds. We can't just be run of them all. Uh, and I think the, other, the third area in terms of, uh, I think, threats and what I need to watch out for is we've got to con continue to reinvigorate the firm. We've got to continue to look at new product. We've got to continue to develop our existing teams because teams have life cycles. People go through their careers, they mature, they get through maturity, and then they want to retire. And we've got to manage that process. 15 teams at the moment, some of those teams are on to second generation managers already. Some will go into third generation, but not all of them will survive. So we've got to continually renew our bench of managers out there.